world! In today's video, we are going to discuss the von Neumann architecture as well as the Harvard architecture. But first of all, let's understand the meaning of this word, that is architecture. Your building, or more specifically, your flat, has a certain layout or design. Similarly, a computer is designed in a certain manner. Your flat has several rooms wherein each serves a particular purpose. Similarly, a computer is made up of several units where each one provides a certain set of functions. Let's talk about von Neumann architecture. First of all, why is it named like that? Von Neumann architecture gets its name from John von Neumann, who is considered to be the inventor of this architecture. Well, there is a little bit of controversy around this, but anyway, the architecture is named after him. Let's have a look at the various components of this architecture. I'll cover their functionalities in a while. The first component is the control unit. Next, we have an ALU or arithmetic and logic unit. Together, they form a CPU or a central processing unit. Next, we have provision for input and output peripherals like mouse, keyboard, printer, monitor, etc. Now, there is just one more important component, but before I label that, Let's have a look at the kind of computers that existed before von Neumann machines. Most of the computers were fixed program devices, which means they were designed for a single purpose only, like a calculator. Others, which were more general purpose computers, were designed by electrical engineers. Thus, programming was more hardware oriented. These machines had various calculating units. And in order to run a specific program, one had to connect specific units together. Connections were made using wires and plug boards. Basically, there was no concept of instructions, which means everything had to be wired accurately. This, as you can imagine, was a time-consuming and an arduous task. Debugging was equally painful. But most of the times, these computers were supposed to run one program only. Thus, frequent rewiring wasn't really required. With von Neumann architecture came the concept of stored program computer, which means one was able to store a program or a set of instructions along with data in a unit known as store. Now, if you wanted to say change the flow of the program or modify the program, then you never had to do any sort of rewiring. You simply had to change or modify the instructions, which means instructions and data were treated alike. They both were modifiable. So the missing component is store. That's the name provided in the original von Neumann model. However, nowadays it is more commonly known as memory. This memory includes both the instructions or program and the data that these instructions manipulate. Memory is connected to the processor via address, data, and a control bus. As we now have all the components in place, let's look at their individual functions. We'll understand the function of each block by considering an instruction cycle. The first step in instruction cycle is fetch. The control unit is responsible for fetching an instruction from the memory. For this, it provides address of the instruction on the address bus, control signals like read, clock, etc. on the control bus. Finally, the instruction arrives towards the processor via the data bus. Next step is decode. The control unit is not only responsible for fetching the instruction, but also decoding it. It deciphers the meaning of the instruction. In other words, it converts the instruction into timing and control signals and feeds them to other components like ALU, input-output devices, etc. Basically, it directs the operations of these components. Or it controls the operations. In simple terms, it is nothing but brain of the computer and it tells the other components what are they supposed to do. Next is loading the operands. This is an optional step. Not every instruction will require it. Here, the operands or data is fetched from the memory. Again, address is provided on address bus, control signals on control bus, and the data travels through the data bus. Note that both the instructions and data are stored in the same memory and they are accessed via a common data bus. This is an important feature of von Neumann architecture. Next step is execution. Control unit activates ALU for execution of the instruction. However, that won't be the case for all the instructions. 
If an instruction requires arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and or logic operations like AND, NOT, etc., then the ALU will be activated by the control unit for the purpose of execution. Finally, the result of calculation is stored in memory. Again, it's an optional step. Not every instruction will require it. Address and control signals are fed via the respective buses and data is sent through the same data bus towards the memory. So that is our fetch, decode, execute instruction cycle. Accessing main memory for data every single time can be a time-consuming process. That's why CPU has some inbuilt registers for quick access of data. Some of these registers are available to the programmers for storing variables temporarily. Others are used by the CPU during the instruction cycle. Let's have a look at two such registers. First is program counter. It is used by the control unit to access the address of the next instruction. Next is the instruction register. This, as its name implies, is used to store the current instruction. All right, now in case of von Neumann architecture, both the instructions and the data share the same bus. Thus, it isn't possible to access them concurrently. Von Neumann architecture is useful in carrying out operations in a sequential manner. Parallel processing is not possible with this architecture. This is our shared memory space, and that's our bus. At a time, either an instruction or data can pass through this bus. This is known as von Neumann bottleneck. Things slow down at the neck of the bottle. What is the consequence of this? Say, even when you have the fastest CPU in the world, which is able to execute instructions quickly, it will spend most of its time waiting for the instruction or data to arrive. Implementing pipelining becomes particularly problematic due to the bottleneck issue. Because in pipelining, sometimes the processor is required to access the instruction and operand or data simultaneously. Is there a way to mitigate this situation? Well, we can have two buses instead of one. One for instruction and another for data. And they can be connected to separate memory spaces. Hold on, that's Harvard architecture. In case of Harvard architecture, instructions and data are stored in separate memories and they have separate address data and control buses. Due to this, it is possible to access data and instructions simultaneously. Additionally, it isn't even necessary to have memories of the same size. That is, the size of instruction and data can be different from each other. For example, you can have more number of data bits in data memory, thus a wider data bus, or more number of addressable locations in instruction memory, thus a wider address bus. Due to parallel processing of data, Harvard architecture seems better than von Neumann when it comes to speed of execution. So, does that mean Harvard architecture is better than von Neumann architecture? Not really. Both the architectures are in common use and have their own set of advantages and limitations. Harvard provides parallel processing, as we've seen earlier, Thus, it mitigates von Neumann bottleneck issue to some extent. But it is costlier to implement as you require separate buses and memories, and overall it is going to take up more space. Von Neumann is clearly easy to implement than Harvard architecture as you require only a single block of memory for both data and instructions. In that sense, it also offers flexibility as you need not bother about splitting the memory between instructions and data. At a later stage, if you want to add new instructions, say in the form of upgrades, then it'll be less challenging in case of von Neumann architecture. In case of Harvard, you have to divide the memory into two parts right at the beginning, which means you will have limited instruction memory. So chances of running out of space at a later stage are more. Apart from that, in case of von Neumann, instructions are nothing but data. Thus, they can be modified and accessed just like data. Thus, instructions of one program can be treated like data by another program. One example of this is when operating system loads an application program from the disk. For the operating system, the application is nothing but merely data, and it loads it on the RAM just like a normal text file. Von Neumann is not a great option from the point of view of security, as instructions are modifiable. In case of Harvard architecture, usually the instructions are stored in a ROM, 
which makes it more secure. Depending upon the requirements of the system, either Howard or von Neumann can be preferred. DSP processors carry out repetitive and numerically intensive tasks. Thus, to speed up execution, it makes absolute sense to dedicate separate memory for both data and instructions. Many a times, there'll be more than one data memory. With this, it becomes possible to access various coefficients, which are required for DSP calculations, concurrently. Most of the microcontrollers, except a few, use Harvard architecture. They have a flash memory for program or instructions and an SRAM for data. Von Neumann is usually preferred in microprocessors. However, most of the modern day devices neither use pure von Neumann nor pure Howard architecture. Now we are human beings, which means we want the best of both the worlds. That's why most of the modern computers use something known as modified Harvard architecture. We look at the components of this architecture in an upcoming video on this channel. Like and share this video. And before I end this one, I have just got two questions. See if you can answer them. You can leave your answers in the comment section below. So the first question is, is it possible to implement pipelining with von Neumann architecture? And the second one is, do you think it was possible to implement conditional branching and loops before the days of von Neumann machines? And please subscribe to the channel. Around 88% of you are not subscribing to the channel. So please don't be a miser. Hit that subscribe button right now. And with that said, I'll see you in the next one. Bye world.